Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, women surrealists Sonic and Shares of Art. We look at the female surrealists who succeeded in a male-dominated movement. A little ball of super energy in an extremely handsome package. How Sonic the Hedgehog went from dud to stud. So I came to And why, if you can't own a Monet, you can now invest in one. It's a man's world, even in art, and especially surrealism. But dig deeper and you'll find female artists have actually made big contributions to the movement. Now, let's pay a visit to a retrospective that's celebrating these underrecognized women. From Leonor Fini to Toyan and Leonora Carrington. They're the other artists of surrealism. And the exhibition Fantastic Women at the Schirren Kunsthalle in Frankfurt is an effort to better understand these artists who helped define the movement. You see the wide range of styles, um, of uh, interests, and the red line is this looking for freedom, for um, an individuality as a woman and as an artist. And they tried doing that in the shadow of what has been called André Breton's sexist remarks. The co-founder of Surrealism's 1929 dated manifesto includes the line, the problem of women is the most marvelous and disturbing problem in all the world. According to art historians, the only way female artists could become a part of Breton's circle was either in the role of a companion or a model. Many of the artists were much younger than the men in the group and they arrived around 1930 in Paris, they looked for freedom, but some of them became uh, girlfriends or um, uh, collaborators of um, male artists. While their male counterparts depicted women as objects of desire, female artists were searching for a new identity by exploring their own reflection or by adopting different roles through their work. With the female artists of surrealism, it's always about the female body and female sexuality from a female perspective. And in the past years, their works are regaining recognition, with retrospectives such as this one in Frankfurt and at Sotheby's. In fact, the auction house was one of the first to organize such a show. Its senior vice president Julian Dawes once said that a lot of female surrealists are still fairly unknown to the general public, even to surrealism enthusiasts. Maybe that will slowly change, or is that too surreal to believe? Kate Conley joins me. She is a professor of Francophone studies at William and Mary University and the author of Surrealist Ghostliness. Hi, it's good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you. So, Kate, when I think of surrealism, I think of, I don't know, Breton, um, Dali, Duchamp, you know, they're all men. But then we just heard that women were actually a part of it as well. So how, to what extent were they influential women? I think that women became very influential as the movement progressed. So in the initial phases in the 1920s, there weren't very many women affiliated with the movement. But starting in the 1930s, more and more women participated in the movement, were exhibited, exhibited in the major shows, were published by the journals and the press, uh, signed the documents, the tracks. Um, surrealism had an ethos of equal love that wasn't really borne out particularly well in real life, but that was nonetheless attractive to women. They felt that they were invited to participate, and they did. But why didn't they participate in the beginning? In the beginning, it was a group of male friends who got together who conducted the first experiments. There were a couple of women in the room, wives and girlfriends. Simone Breton, for example, is in the iconic photographs by Man Ray. Uh, but they weren't that present in those early years of the movement in the 1920s. It's really starting in the 1930s that women 
joined the movement more fully, partly because it was in the 1930s that the movement became more international. And many of the women affiliated with surrealism came from other countries. They were not French. Leonore Carrington was British, Frida Kahlo was Mexican, Dorothea Tanning was American, Lee Miller was American. Many of the women affiliated with the surrealist movement who were attracted to its aesthetic uh, were from other countries. So they helped to internationalize the movement. Okay, so um, in the beginning, women were part of the movement, I think, as just companions or models. And then they Primarily. sort of... Primarily. Yes. So, uh, and obviously, under Breton, uh, the leader of the movement, he asserted that it was, a, above all, a revolutionary movement. So I want to ask you, how revolutionary was it when it comes to uh, male gaze? I think that it was unique in the avant-garde world at the time, because uh, women were invited to participate, women were included. Uh, Dorothea Tanning has a lovely sentence on the first page of her first autobiography, Birthday, in which she said it was a banquet open to one and all. She felt invited to participate in the banquet. She's referring to Plato's symposium, which was a conversation. She felt that she was invited into the conversation as a, as a woman in the, in the movement. Mm. Okay, Boyd Haycock says um, he is a he is a art critic art historian he says that um, Breton was seeking control uh, as a leader especially including um, of women do you agree that he was sort of trying to uh, have a hold of women in the movement I think he was trying to have a, move, uh, a hold on the movement I think that first statement is absolutely true and Breton had sort of a dom domineering personality one aspect of Breton's personality though that I think was uh, positive for the movement as a whole, is that uh, every time he fell in love, he would write a new book and it would be a tribute to the new woman he had fallen in love with. And uh, he was always willing to admit that he was wrong. Um, this is a very endearing uh, character trait in a domineering personality, mm -hmm. that uh, he was willing to say, well, I thought I had it right, but I, I didn't fully have it right, and now I've met this new person and she's transformed my life, um, and now I'm thinking in new ways. So uh, the first book he wrote that was in honor of a woman was Naja in 1928, the second one was Mad Love in 1937, and the third one was Arcanum 17 in 1945. So uh, he was constantly renewing his own ideas and revising himself, and often those revisions were influenced by women in his life. Okay, so moving on from this, Kate, um, we do see a lot more female surrealists in major exhibitions around the world lately. Do you feel like the ground is shifting towards more understanding and a grasp of the situation? I certainly hope so. I have to say that the first history of the Surrealist movement that came out really didn't mention women at all. So it has taken scholars like me, many scholars, starting with Whitney Chadwick, uh, Marianne Cause, Susan Suleiman, who wrote books and mounted exhibitions that really uh, taught us a lot more about who the women were. Um, there also was more interested interest in paying attention to the paintings by women and the writings by women. One aspect that drew women to surrealism was the idealization of the woman by surrealist poets and painters. Mm -hmm. And women artists became very interested in revising that version of the idealized female muse by the men. And mm -hmm. so they contributed self-portraits and autobiographies in abundance that basically had the effect of saying, no, this is what a woman looks like. This is what it's like to really be a woman in the surrealist movement. So there are testimonials starting in the 1930s that come from women about what their experience was to be a surrealist artist. And these are increasingly available and I think they're changing the way we understand the history. Well, let's hope that they will keep changing the way we understand history. Kate Conley, good to have you on our show today. Thank you so much. Paramount Pictures' first attempt at Sonic the Hedgehog was pummeled by a massive revolt from the fans and critics and even the creator of everyone's favorite 8-bit character. So how did this video game adaptation beat tough competition last week at the box office? Ali Jan has the answer for us. Uh, meow? This was fans' first look at Paramount Pictures' version of Sonic. To put it simply, 
Sonic's appearance was just too human looking. And the freakout on YouTube was reflected in the hundreds of thousands of dislikes for the trailer. In 1991, Sonic was the blue face of Sega and became one of the most successful video game franchises since Mario, selling more than 800 million games worldwide. The secret to Sonic's success is cute and cartoony look. I'm Sonic, a little ball of super energy in an extremely handsome package. But the trailer disregarded this vital point and fans let the studio know. One tech-savvy follower in particular re-edited the trailer with his own design of Sonic that took the Hedgehog back to its roots. And that might have been the wake-up call Paramount needed. In a rare move seen in Hollywood, Paramount actually listened to the stress signal. Postponing the release date of the flick, they sent their visual effects people back to work to give audiences what they wanted. Fans responded and flocked to theaters on the movie's opening day. And Sonic the Hedgehog can now claim the best opening weekend for a video game adaptation, raking in $57 million, taking over first place at the box office from Birds of Prey. Perhaps Sonic serves as a lesson for studios when their trailers get trounced by the fans. Here's looking at you, Ghostbusters. Now, here's your look at what else is going on in the world of art and music. A group of home invaders in Los Angeles have killed American rapper Bashar Baraka Jackson, also known as Pop Smoke. His friends called the police about a home invasion early Wednesday morning. Doctors later said Jackson died from being shot. Police are still investigating the motive for the attack. Jackson's latest album was released just last week and climbed quickly into the Billboard's top 10. The city of Baghdad has put on display 158 of its recovered artifacts, dating 4,000 years old. The ancient Sumerian items were looted during the Iraqi wars of 1991 and 2003. They were brought back from Saudi Arabia, the UK, Switzerland and South Korea. The country is trying to restore its cultural heritage with the help of UNESCO. Oman is hosting the first ever Jordan Caricature Festival. The event honors the country's cartoonists and helps raise awareness of children's rights in the Arab world. The festival's theme focuses on several child-related issues, including child labor and child marriage. Looking to invest 20 bucks? A New York company says you can use it for a piece of art. Well, a share of the artwork anyway. It's a first-of-a-kind exchange and we're going to speak to the founder and CEO about how his business plan is supposed to make money. But first, Nursena is here to explain what the company actually says it does. Masterworks says it's serving up pieces of the artistic pie. The two-year-old company says, through shareholding, anyone can have the rights to world-renowned masterpieces. They argue that the art market has been outperforming the stock market for the last 50 years. Especially blue-chip art, which is art created by the top 100 most selling artists such as Andy Warhol, Picasso and Monet. For example, this Vincent van Gogh painting was sold to someone at auction in 2012 for around $16 million. It was then sold in 2018 for more than $39 million. California Bank by the British painter David Hockney was purchased in 2000 for more than $300,000 and 18 years later sold for more than $4 million. And we concluded in conjunction with Citibank that the correlation factor between art and other asset classes is roughly 0.13. And what that means as an average investor is that if the stock market goes up or down, you shouldn't necessarily expect art to perform in the same way. So it's a great hedge or a great way to diversify a portfolio. As well as playing with the big boys, Masterworks also gives the option to invest in younger and living artists. 
That's probably where that $20 is going to. They're lesser known, but easier to invest. We, we have 36,000 investors signed up today. So um, investors range from, from very small investors who are in college to larger investors that are, that are viewing this as a, a serious um, allocation of a portfolio. But it's, it's really everyone across the board. So you still may not be able to put a Monet over your fireplace, but just maybe Masterworks will make you money as if you did. Joining me now is the CEO and founder of Masterworks, Scott Lynn. Hi, Scott. So you believe, obviously, that art is good investment, and the figures support this. I want to start off by asking, why do you think art industry is so strong and stable, even under like fragile economic um, contexts? It's a very good question. We've done a lot of research um, on this topic specifically, and we, we tend to think that our prices are correlated with um, global ultra wealth creation. So this is a 300 plus year old asset class that, um, that really has been traded amongst the ultra wealthy up until Masterworks. So we really have created a platform that for the first time allows anyone to invest uh, in this asset class independent of how much money they have. Okay, so a lot of people say that as artworks are unique, that's what uh, keeps the uh, industry so stable. Do you think that makes sense? Uh, we tend to believe that, that art prices increase in part because um, supply is always continuously decreasing. So if you think about a particular artist like Andy Warhol, who's painted um, hundreds if not thousands of paintings during his lifetime, many of the collectors that wind up owning those paintings wind up donating them to institutions uh, as they pass away or, or throughout time, which causes supply to shrink. And art's one of the very few asset classes where supply is continuously decreasing. Okay. Andy Warhol, for example, obviously he, he belongs to a certain segment of the art market. So some segments of the art market definitely outperform uh, major asset classes. But then what about the other segments? Yeah, I mean, we, we tend to think that there's, there's two segments of the art market that we find interesting. One is what we refer to as blue chip art. And to us, that just very narrowly means art created by the top 100 um, artists in terms of sales volume. The other segment that we find interesting is uh, mid-career or living artists who are established, so artists that are selling more than 20 or 30 million US dollars um, that, um, that are more predictable or, or have more data around them. There's obviously certain segments of the art market, such as um, what we refer to as, as the primary segment, which is um, less investable and just more speculative. And do you stay away from mid-segment? Is it only blue chip artists that you're investing in? Yeah, we, we tend to find that that blue chip um, and, you know, blue chip more broadly defined is the most predictable, uh, meaning that returns are the most predictable within the blue chip segment. Um, but again, we, we do think that the mature and, and mid-career artists are interesting investments, but we, we tend to stay away from artists that don't have auction track records or artists that don't have, have established careers. Okay, so let's talk about a project a little. I mean, I have <clears throat> lots of questions, but Let's start with this. Where are all these paintings? Do you keep them in a storage or do you lend them to museums for people to see? Yeah, all of the above. So we also have a gallery in New York City where you can come and visit the paintings uh, located in Soho. But, but some paintings do sit in storage. We, we obviously try to lend out as many paintings as we can <clears throat> to museums or institutions over time. Um, and that's something that we're, we're more focused on uh, this year and, and next year as well. Okay, well, Scott Lynn, CEO and founder of Masterworks, I appreciate you joining us today on Showcase. Thank you. As clashes in Beirut litter the streets with gas canisters and broken bottles, one artist is seeing these discarded materials of protest as a means to make art and not just to make pretty sculptures. Hayat Nazar says her installations have a message. It's been more than a hundred days. Lebanese protesters are still on the streets of Beirut and Hayat Nazar found her inspiration in the ruins of the demonstrations. I had a problem with myself. I used to wonder what art could do. How can it change things? How can I be beneficial for society? I'm a person who believes that we came into this world not just so we can live, eat, drink, have fun, and then just leave and it's over. No, 
every one of us should have a role, a task that must be accomplished. So I thought, what role can I play through art? So, she collected the police's tear gas canisters, fired at the demonstrators, and the protesters rocks thrown at the security forces. And she turned them into a sculpture that she calls Heart of the Revolution. With the revolution, when I started to express myself, I didn't know that people would even see my art or take pictures. But then I felt people were really interacting with my projects. Nazar also invited others to help making her art, and together they created a phoenix symbolizing the resilience of the Lebanese people. People need to continue to have courage and to come down to the streets and demand their rights. In the end, we are demanding to live with dignity. We are not protesting with or against a political party or someone. We just want to live. And she wants the activists to be remembered. Nazar's work is emblazoned with the names of people still on the streets and those who have lost their lives. Alexis Gruchenko was a maverick artist based in Moscow. He was famous, he was contemporary for his time. And then this little thing called the Bolshevik Revolution happened. That's when Grichenko came to Istanbul and things for him started to change. What exactly? Sena Arslan explains. Alexis Grichenko was already a well-rounded artist, an art theorist, an expert on iconography by the time he came to Istanbul. He wrote hundreds of pages here and later published his notes as a book called Two Years in Constantinople. He was a keen observer, a visionary from Moscow, where he had to escape soon after the Bolshevik Revolution. He arrived in Istanbul as a refugee, a strange man in a strange land with much to share. Alexis Grichenko was influenced by Cubism and Futurism. These are early 20th century art movements. And when he came to Istanbul in 1919, he found the city under occupation. But he was still pretty much influenced by the colors and movements that he found in the bazaars, mosques and streets of Istanbul. His unique style was called Dynamo Color. To see what's it like, check out his self-portrait. See the boxy forms and architectural lines. This is him in a cubist style, not mimicking his true appearance, but seeing himself in a new light. And this here is a portrait of Grichenko in Istanbul, painted by his close friend Namık Ismail. So you get the idea. This is how Dinoma Color gives him a unique vision when he painted everyday life in the city. The fishermen, the coffee shops, the women in their colorful clothes. Grichenko will show Istanbulites, all the people who once visited Istanbul, the colors and forms that are hidden in the details of the city. Therefore, these cubic structures in Istanbul, whether it be city walls or mosques, the artist notices them much better than us. He sees Istanbul with fresh eyes and shows us that view. And today, the Meshar Gallery's exhibition in Istanbul has retraced Grichenko's steps. Remember Namık Ismail? This was his wife, Münire. And art historian Ayşe Nurgüler has seen this portrait, has known about this portrait, but when she found out about the photograph, she got very excited. In the photograph, there's a detail of the, of the camel, uh, which uh, Grichenko describes in his memoirs, and it matches the photograph. So we have uh, the photograph, the memoir, the painting, uh, everything's coming together and these are all traces of Grichenko we can find in Istanbul, his, tracing his footsteps. Uh, so it, we, and as art historians, we don't always get this lucky. Another close friend to him was Ibrahim Çalı. Together they explored the Mevlevi Hanes, the place where Turkey's whirling dervishes practiced. In this part of the exhibition, you can see Grichenko and Çalı next to each other. 
Along with Namık İsmail, Çalı was in a group of artists known as the 1914 generation. They were one of the first painters who brought contemporary trends to Turkish art scene. This is actually a very important example of interaction we can still learn from today. It's very important for a painter who came to Istanbul as a refugee from Moscow to establish a life here, to make friends with the painters here, to be inspired by them, to reflect this relationship in his works and to affect their style as well. So take that, social media. With no LinkedIn, no couch surfing, Grichenko came to Istanbul amidst a revolution and built relationships that influenced his work, more than any influencer could today. Sena Arslan, TRT World, Istanbul. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Check out all the videos on our YouTube channel. I'm Elif Thanks for watching. Bye for now.